Good morning and happy Sabbath. It's a privilege to once again be able to share this week's lesson with you. And it's an exciting one because we're looking specifically at Jesus and how he acted as our master teacher. So this all fits into the whole quarter's theme of education and ultimately which teacher best to learn from than the creator of the universe, the creator of the humanity. So ultimately it's an exciting lesson and actually quite frankly one too short to fit into one session. But that being said, let us open with a word of prayer as we allow the Holy Spirit to work through us in a wonderful way. Let us pray. Thank you, Father, for the privilege of once again being able to study the lesson. And Father, ultimately your word. And as we look and willing to learn at your feet to ultimately teach us your will and your way and what your, your plan for our lives would be. Father, we pray that the Holy Spirit would work in a mighty way to open our hearts and our minds as we are going to look at Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, the teacher from which we desire so greatly to learn from. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's look at our memory verse just to get things started off with. That's 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6, which reads, For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the fact of Jesus Christ. And that's a beautiful, uh, beautiful verse that. But I think ultimately the question that we would like to ask from that little verse would be one where it is, what is the goal of Jesus' teaching? Now that verse so beautifully stated, maybe I should just revert back to the verse actually stated that ultimately it was the glory of God that Jesus came to reveal. And I think, you know, if we actually ask the question, what was the goal of Jesus' teaching? I would argue, and it is emphasized through the whole lesson, is to reveal the Father. Now we'll look at that a little bit later. Let me not jump the gun in this instance. But I think ultimately it is beautiful, descriptive language. We look at light shining in darkness. It is supposed to awaken in us the reality that it is for our own good, it is for our own edification that Jesus came to teach. So what was the goal of Jesus' teaching? And I think, let us just look here at maybe an introduction before we jump right into answering that question a little bit deeper as well. So, I think an interesting fact is of the 90 times Jesus was addressed directly in the gospel, 60 of them addressed him as teacher. Now that's an amazing statistic if you actually just think about it, how Jesus a large degree, was and is our teacher. Now, just take this into consideration. The fact that the Bible speaks about rabbi, master, teacher, prophet, even instructor in the Gospels are really, you know, something to take note of because ultimately it reveals to us the nature of Christ, how he desires for us to learn. I think there's an amazing reality in that where we need to grasp and come to terms with the fact that we will learn at Jesus' feet as long as we live. I think maybe, let me put it in another way, as long as we desire to learn. I think the problem comes in when we no longer desire to learn, when we become either lazy or complacent or even lukewarm. That is where the challenge comes in, ultimately, where we no longer are able to learn from God. Now, just James Stewart's you know, quote here, the teaching of Jesus has a power and an effect with which the influence of no other teacher can even for a moment be compared. Jesus is the greatest teacher. There is no doubt or, or no argument around that. There, there can never be. Now, a big question here. What method did Jesus use to teach humanity? And I think when I hear a method that Jesus used, immediately my mind goes to this beautiful quote from Ministry of Healing. Christ's method alone will give true success in reaching people. The Savior mingled with people as one who desired their good. He showed sympathy for them, ministered to their needs, and won their confidence. Then he invited them, follow me. Beautiful quote here where we ultimately look at the fact and I highlight or put the words in bold behind me. Mingled, desired their good. He had sympathy. He ministered to their needs and not just spiritual but physical, emotional needs. And he won their confidence. Now, bear in mind that that was Christ's 
method of reaching out to humanity. And I think if we can follow the same method to really be interested and really care for people, we would do well to learn from Christ. Now, another question. What was the goal of Jesus' teaching? This was the one we asked in the beginning. And I think we need to look here at a couple of methods that Jesus used. And ultimately, the goal would come through as we discuss this whole week's lesson. So just keep in mind, what was the goal of his teaching? Notice here, once again, that Jesus taught via parables and stories. And ultimately, it is an effective way because it reaches all ages. I mean, if we tell the parables today, and it's one of the children's stories for this, the Sabbath as well, the parable of the prodigal son, it's something everybody can relate to, regardless of age, background, race, gender, everybody can relate to that story. If we tell the parable of the woman with the lost coin, last week's story that I told for the children, all of these parables actually relate so well to any age and everybody, you know, of all walks of life. So Mark 4 verse 34 actually tells us that Jesus spoke through parables because that was the way that people were able to learn and comprehend what he was teaching. But Jesus also taught using object lessons. Matthew 18 verse 1 to 4. Jesus used children to make a point where he describes the kingdom of heaven belonging to such as these. And ultimately we can look at Mark chapter 12 also where you look at the widow's coins where they were sitting in the temple looking at the people bringing in offerings and tithe. And Jesus actually draws everybody's attention to that woman putting in two coins and ultimately makes a whole object lesson from that. So object lessons are you know, very relevant when it comes to teaching. But another way that Jesus taught was by using exaggerated speech. The big word would be he used hyperboles in the sense that he wanted to drive home the point. Now, I'm not saying that's a lie in the sense that exaggeration can be called lying. But in Jesus' case, it was to really bring home the message. For instance, Matthew 5, pluck out your eyes or cut off your hands if something causes you to sin. Now, it's not a literal expectation but ultimately, we would do better off without a hand or with an eye than we would losing salvation. Matthew chapter 7. If the splinter is in your eye or in somebody's eye, don't forget to look at the beam in your own eye. Now, obviously, this is not referring to a log coming out of my eye. But it's to bring home the point that we need to, you know, really be careful what we think of others or judge about others. Ultimately, Jesus used exaggerated speech. But Jesus also used memorable sayings, like one of the greatest ones in Luke chapter 6, verse 31, the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto yourself. That's essentially what Jesus brought home. And I mean, that saying is being used right through the ages for people to sort of be a guide as how we are to treat other people. Now, continuing Jesus' methods, he asked questions. Now, this is something that I can relate to because I enjoy learning from asking questions. And I think ultimately, if we don't ask questions, we won't learn. I think teachers will be able to also confess that the only stupid question that exists is the question that is never asked. Because then it will never be answered. Now, notice Matthew 16 verse 26. What does it help to gain the world but you lose your life? It's a question Jesus asked. And it was really to bring home the, the implication of what are we doing? Where are we heading to? How is our life being spent? Matthew 22, verse 10 to 21. Whose image is on the coin? When the, the Pharisees questioned Jesus with regards to paying tax, Jesus asked a simple question and it caused them to ponder what he was doing. I think maybe one of the most well-known ones would be John chapter 8, where Jesus asks the, the, the woman caught in adultery, where are your accusers? It was not a, a simple question because they were clearly not there according to the narrative. But for that woman, that question really brought home the point of her actions and of Jesus' forgiveness and ultimately his grace, his love. So Jesus taught by asking questions. And ultimately, Jesus also used repetition. Now, I think here we have Mark 8 verse 31, Mark 9 verse 31, and ultimately Mark 10 verse 33 and 44 where Jesus repeatedly spoke about his death that was coming as the sort of fulfillment of his purpose here on earth. Now, it's amazing that we can sort of understand that Jesus used these six methods to drive 
home the reality of why he came, what his mission was, what he wanted to teach them. You know, and ultimately, I want to ask the following question. What can we learn from the way that Jesus taught? Maybe just extending that question, how can we apply it in our methods of teaching? In other words, if I look at those six methods that Jesus used, can I actually apply that in the way that I maybe present the lesson study or in the way that I preach or in the way that I even tell children's stories? And beloved, you need to ask those questions as well, whether you can actually apply the way that Jesus taught in the church ministry you are involved in, whether it be the deaconry or, or the elder or even the Sabbath school um, superintendent. These are methods we can use without a shadow of a doubt. Now, looking at Sunday's lesson, we talk about Jesus coming to reveal the Father. And I want to read here Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 to 4. God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers in prophets, in many portions and in many ways, in these last days, has spoken to us in his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. And he is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature and upholds all things by the word of his power. When he had made purification of sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much better than the angels as he had inherited a more excellent name than they. Notice here that Jesus has sort of a twofold aspect that he came to do in his teaching. Now, firstly, I want us to take note of the first. Obviously, he came to reveal the Father. That is clear. But there's another statement made here as a, represent as a representation of his nature, which is clear that he came to represent God's nature. But it's amazing because he not only came to represent the Father, but he also came to purify of sins. So he came to represent, he came to reveal but he also came to save. And I think that is an amazing thing we need to realize is that Jesus came for a variety of reasons, not just one. He came to reveal the Father. He came to dwell among men. He came to teach. He came to save. He came to purify. He came to atone. He came to reconcile. There are a number of reasons why Jesus came and we cannot just isolate one without looking at the other. We need to look at all of these reasons why Jesus came to earth. Now, big question, what is the implication of Jesus revealing the Father to us? And it might sound like a bit of a strange question, but the implication is really actually very comprehensive. Maybe just drawing your attention to another verse where I actually believe it answers this question. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 1 and 2. Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. You see beloved the implication of Jesus revealing the Father is that we in return will reveal Jesus to a broken world. So there's no way that I can just sit idly by and say, you know what? Jesus came to reveal. He came to save. Now I just wait for him to return. <laughs> no, beloved. The expectation is that we will go out and also represent Jesus to a broken world. Now, ultimately, I want to read a quote here from Ellen White. And I think it really hits the nail on the head once again. To bring humanity into Christ, to bring the fallen race into oneness with divinity is the work of redemption. Take note, the work of redemption is to do what? To bring humanity into Christ, into oneness with divinity. That's a mind-blowing statement. Christ took human nature that men might be one with him, as he is one with the Father, that God may love man as he loves his only begotten Son, that men may be partakers of the divine nature. Now, just take note of what is happening here. We become partakers of the divine nature. In other words, we need to really accept and understand the implication of what happens when we decide to follow Christ. It is not good enough to say, I'll do the bare minimum to get to heaven. What is expected here is for us to excel in pursuing God so that we might represent him in a clearer, 
way ever thought possible because ultimately my experience with him I need to share with others as well. Now moving on to Tuesday's lesson, reading the master's or master teacher's mind. And I think here Jesus teaches from a premise of, now I'll get there, just bear with me as I read this verse. Philippians 2 verse 2 and uh, right through 2 verse 5. Make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. So, reverting back to the first statement. Jesus teaches from a a premise of humility. He teaches from a premise of other-centeredness. And even, you know, maybe more important, he has a clear purpose of why he is teaching. I think there's nothing worse than a teacher who teaches without a sense of purpose. Who maybe just wants to be there to collect a paycheck. That is the worst kind of teacher because they're literally teaching without passion, without emotion, without any drive in them. And Jesus had humility. He looked out for others' needs and he had a great sense of purpose. So beloved, if we want to look at the master's mind, those are the characteristics that we pursue in order to more clearly represent God to a broken world. How can we practically place The interests of those we aim to teach first. And this is a question I want you to maybe reflect some time on. We're not going to discuss it now in that depth. But I want you to discuss it with those you are worshipping today with. Practically speaking, how can we place others' interests ahead of those of our own? Now, Wednesday's lesson. The teacher and reconciliation. Now, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 is one of the most amazing chapters because I actually believe this calls to our mission, to our our reason of existence. Notice verse 18 and uh, right through to 20. Now, all these things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, namely that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself not counting their trespasses against them, and he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Notice, not only are we reconciled and it's amazing and it's good news and it's profound, but we have also received the work of reconciliation to go and do. Notice, therefore we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were making an appeal. Other translations say, say, as though God was begging, pleading through us, We beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. We are ambassadors, beloved. Being an ambassador actually requires us to represent in the highest sense of the word. It means we are no longer citizens of this earth. We are citizens of heaven because an ambassador cannot be a representative of that which he does not belong to already. So for us to be ambassadors is a profound realization of our work ahead of us. Jesus is more than a mere teacher. He is our savior. How does this impact your faith? Now, moving on to the incarnation of Christ, Thursday's lesson. I just want to read this quote, and I know it's a lengthy one, but just bear with me. In contemplating the incarnation of Christ in humanity, we stand baffled before an unfathomable mystery that the human mind cannot comprehend The more we reflect upon it, the more amazing it does appear. How wide is the contrast between the divinity of Christ and the helpless infant in Bethlehem's manger? How can we span the distance between the mighty God and a helpless child? And yet the creator of worlds, he in whom was the fullness of the Godhead, bodily was manifest in the helpless babe in the manger. Far higher than any of the angels, equal with the Father in dignity and glory, and yet wearing the garb of humanity. Divinity and humanity were mysteriously combined, and man and God became one. It is this union that we find the hope of our fallen race. Looking upon Christ in humanity, we look upon God 
and see in him the brightness of his glory, the express image of his person. Beloved, this is why partly I believe we will remain students forever and Jesus will remain our teacher for all eternity. Because the reality is the more we contemplate this, the more awestruck we actually become. Because it just doesn't make sense to our minds that the creator, our God, the most powerful, you know, God would come down and take a finite body for us. That is amazing beyond comprehension. What does Jesus' incarnation mean to you? And this is something we need to answer for ourselves because this would give us the purpose in our teaching and reaching out to others. Now, in closing, I just want to share some characteristics of Jesus as a teacher. Firstly, Jesus taught with power, not power from within himself, but power which he got from his father by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. His teaching was unique because he had this power and authority that he spoke with and he approached it in ways as we mentioned that really appealed to the people he taught children he taught adults he taught learned people he taught the commoners he taught the sinners the tax collectors he taught everybody he was unique in the way that he taught jesus had a broad spectrum of learners and students and jesus always placed people first above his own needs or wants he challenged his followers and ultimately he taught with authority and purpose. And Jesus taught his disciples to talk to God, ultimately in prayer. And beloved, as we progress through the Sabbath and as we continue to worship God, my prayer is that we would continue to learn at the feet of Jesus. Never, ever, ever, ever stop learning. Let us close off with a word of prayer. Our kind and loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for your grace and your willingness to always teach us. We are humbled by your grace. And Father, we pray that as we continue to grow in your love, we pray that we would truly be more effective to reach out to this broken world. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless and happy Sabbath as you continue to learn from Christ.